Luce in South Minneapolis. It's on Q, the program that explores our urban environment. Phil Lindsay's guests include Mark Vandershaft, talking about life on the northern Mississippi. Michelle Martin, discussing neighborhood grassroots efforts. Plus thoughts from Holly Glick about the Committee on Urban Environment. All this and more on Q September 2003. Here's your host, Phil Lindsay. Hello and welcome to the show. On this show we're going to talk a little bit about water. How water helped in the settlement of the Upper Midwest. And we're also going to talk on a grassroots level about what one neighborhood is doing to manage rainwater before it runs off into our lakes and streams. And I'll be back with our first guest, Mark Vandershaft, to talk about Grand Excursion 2004, right after we go into Pizza Luce and talk with the manager. My name is Laura, and I'm the general manager here at Pizza Luce in, on Lindale. Um, we're at 32nd and Lindale um, in uptown Minneapolis. And the reason that I really, really like Pizza Luce is the people that I work with. Um, everybody that I work with here, I can say that I, I, I think I love every single one of them. Everybody's unique in their own way. Um, they're very intelligent and responsible. Um, I feel very fortunate to have these guys working with me. Um, the food here is unique in the fact that it's fresh, it's not processed. Um, you can get a vegan pizza. The menu is really diverse and um, it caters to everybody. You can bring grandpa here that needs steak and potatoes and you can bring um, the little vegan emo core guy that doesn't want any dairy product or anything and he can eat here safely with his grandparents. So it's a cool place to work. It's got good food and the energy at the store is phenomenal. We'll be right on. Well, thanks, Laura. It's nice to be here at Pizza Lucci. It's one of uh, the crews and my favorite restaurants in town. Our first guest is Mark Vandershaft, and uh, actually he probably has a lot of titles we could call him, but I think of him as the instigator of Grand Excursion 2004. It's nice to have you on the show. Good to be on the show, Phil. Well, now, on the show we're talking about water and its role in sort of the development and the sustainability and the settlement of this part of the country. The Grand Excursion that you're working on, which is a recreation of a historical one, sounds fascinating. Tell us about it, and how did you come up with the idea? Well, I was a native of eastern Iowa, Cedar Rapids, and uh, grew up thinking that the Mississippi River was a really magical place, and especially the uh, upper Mississippi, north of uh, what we call the Quad Cities, Devonport, Rock Island, all the way to uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And I always wondered, uh, as, as a young person, why that part of the river didn't receive more attention. And I always sort of had an idea that something should be done to fix that. Uh, almost 10 years ago now, in 1994, I was reading a book called Steamboating on the Upper Mississippi River by William Peterson, historian. And it told about the grand excursion of 1854, which was this amazing event along that part of the river. Uh, it was held at that time to uh, commemorate the arrival of the railroad from the East Coast to the Mississippi River. And uh, approximately 1,200 people gathered in Chicago, took a train to Rock Island, and then took river boats all the way up here to St. Paul and the Falls of St. Anthony. Um, I work as a employee for the city of St. Paul, and in 1994, we were starting to do riverfront redevelopment seriously, and saying in about 10 years, we want to do something to show off what we've accomplished. Uh, what occurred to me at that time that 10 years from 1994 would also be the 150th anniversary of the original Grand Excursion. So the idea that I suggested uh, to our Riverfront Corporation and then to Mayor Coleman was uh, let's do something like this again. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, everybody said, yeah, let's do it. Well, what a great overview for this. And it came out of that sort of classic book. Yes. And just was that personal interest of yours that you were reading that and loved the river having been, uh, what, a child I, growing yeah, up? Yeah, I think that's the easiest way to explain yeah. it. I'm a little bit of an amateur historian, so I read books like that uh, for fun now and then. And well, now, Mark, you mentioned uh, that the, the boats came up to St. Paul, which existed at that time. Yes. Minneapolis actually did not exist at that time. Well, it didn't exist legally. Um, the, <laughs> There were about 300 uh, illegal squatters living in, on the 
west bank of the Mississippi River at the falls. And in 1852, one of them suggested that they call themselves Minneapolis. So there was the name, there was a little community there, but it wasn't legal, and it wasn't the big town in the area at the time. But for purposes of the excursion, people knew about the falls. They knew about the falls. And they wanted to come over and see that. That's right. That was a, a place that uh, some people compared at the time to Niagara Falls. Now, if you took that a little too literally, you might be disappointed at yeah. the time. But I think it did uh, express the sense that this was a beautiful falls that deserved to be seen. That's what people thought in the 19th century. And you mentioned the railroad that had been completed to the Mississippi, but at that yeah. time, what you're saying is that there was no railroad that came up to the great Northwest. No, there yeah. wasn't. We were totally dependent on steamboats at that right. time. So we it was were, the river. It was. That was the way to do it. Yeah. Um, what did it mean then, once this excursion had come up, and apparently it was quite successful, hundreds of people, many hundreds of people participated. Mm -hmm. uh, it got a lot of media attention. Enormous. I think Larry King had just started back then or something. <laughs> but what did it mean for settlement on the upper Mississippi, having had that excursion? Well, the uh, people who who did the excursion, they did it for several reasons. These were the builders of the railroad, and they wanted to highlight that their railroad, they intended to cross the river at Rock Island and go all the way out to the Pacific, which uh, eventually did happen. Uh, but they also wanted to sort of showcase this new uh, territory of Minnesota and uh, encourage people to be interested in settling here. And, the newspaper accounts at the time, there were approximately 50 newspapers represented on the trip, so there were a lot of stories about what it's like in Minnesota and what a good place this would be to, to live. And uh, uh, there was a lot of discussion at the time about, well, is this, uh, there was Galena, Illinois newspaper said, this trip is going to be worth 20,000 settlers to St. Paul. So, wow. There was the sense that it did a lot to accelerate settlement in the uh, mid-1850s. And certainly the expectations were raised in any case, yes. and people knew yeah. more about it. Of course, 1854, pre-Civil War. Um, Galena, I know, later became well-known because I think U.S. Grant. One of nine Civil War generals from that town. From, from that town? Mm -hmm. Nine. That I didn't know. That's fascinating. Amazing. Now, you mentioned um, the northern Mississippi, which you and I share that the love of that. I mean, the bluff country. Um, I'm not familiar too much with the Quad Cities, but those bluffs down around Dubuque and along that stretch, McGregor, yeah. beautiful area. But, and those of us who love Mark Twain as a writer and for what he highlighted about the river, give him credit. But he also kind of skewed people's thinking about the river in a way. I mean, exactly. tell us about that. Well, several years ago, Time Magazine did a cover story feature on the Mississippi River that I think is uh, symptomatic of what Mark Twain accomplished for good and for bad, um, it says almost nothing about the river north of Hannibal, Missouri. And that's the image that many people have now, thanks to Mark Twain. Uh, what we're discovering as we look back to uh, the age before Mark Twain is that, uh, to a large extent, people in America and even Europe thought of this upper Mississippi River when they thought about the Mississippi because the scenery was so much better here than anywhere else. So in a sense, we're trying to recreate that, that sense of wonder and, and grandeur of this stretch of the river uh, by returning to an age when that's the way it was understood. Well, you brought the, the latest, I don't know if, who can catch this, but the latest brochure about the Grand Excursion 2004. And I'm sure this is too small for the cameras, but inside is a little diagram here of the numerous cities and towns along the northern Mississippi. 54 are part of Grand Excursion 2004. Yeah. And having not been to all of them, but the ones that I've been to, it really is gorgeous. The bluffs, the vistas, yes. the islands that you can see there. One of your roles, at least as I've heard you described, is you're the historian, the archivist for this. Have you found out anything extraordinary or surprising about the, excur the original excursion or the response over the time? Anything? odd come to your mind? Well, I think the, uh, the amazing thing that I've discovered is that excursions uh, to celebrate railroads and things like that were not unusual. But typically what those excursions did was go out to the end of the line, look around, and go back. And they might have been, you know, 50, couple hundred people involved. Uh, this excursion was much uh, greater magnitude, and people at the time recognized it. They, uh, 
They referred to it as an event such as had never happened in America before. Uh, the 1,200 people on the excursion were all very well known. They're the kind that would show up in People magazine if it were being published then. And so, uh, in a sense, it was like a week-long leadership retreat for the, uh, the uh, leaders of the, of the United States, particularly the Northeast and Midwest, which uh, um, people on the trip just marveled that that could have happened and could have been pulled off with very few uh, unpleasant incidents. Well, nobody yeah. got sick, nobody died. Well, that's amazing in yeah. itself. And plus, yeah. they had those 50 media outlets yes. right there with them as well. That's right. Let's swing up to the, to the near future here. What are the plans for Grand Excursion 2004? When does stuff start happening? And certainly here in the Twin Cities, what's happening? Well, Grand Excursion 2004 will actually be a year-long series of events, uh, starting really with the Winter Carnival and the NHL All-Star Game in, in St. Paul. We're going to use that as an opportunity to make the world, the hockey world at least, aware of, of Grand Excursion and the Upper Mississippi River. Uh, throughout the year, there will be events going on of various sorts. Uh, the Keystone event, though, will be uh, the end of June and July 4th weekend here in the Twin Cities when we will recreate the, uh, the train from Chicago to Rock Island and then the riverboat flotilla from uh, Rock Island to, uh, to St. Paul. And uh, there'll be many opportunities for people to, uh, to take either the whole trip or, or little short pieces of it and participate in this recreation. Well, Mark, in order to do that, how can people get more information or get in touch with um, Grand Excursion 2004? Probably the easiest way, if you have internet access, just go to www.grandexcursion.com, and that will have all the information you need about tickets and about the various events. Uh, there is now, in the new brochure, actually a phone number for tickets that is also brand new, so I don't have it memorized, but it's uh, 1-866-GEX-2004. I guess that's pretty easy yeah, to remember, remember though. Booked up to the event, to the, the, that the recreation. Be, that would be for tickets Ticket. for the flotilla, sure. yes. And I know you have an office as well, I think, in St. Paul. Yes. And we can get that number up on the screen as well. Very good. Good. Well, Mark, thanks for sharing uh, your information. I know there's some nice images on that website as well. So. Yes, there are. Thanks for your good work, and we look forward to 2004 and celebrating a historic opening of this part of the country. My Thanks pleasure. Thanks for being here. Well, we'll be back in a moment uh, to talk about the Fulton Rainwater Management Project. But first, let's take a look at something we do around here with water for fun, the Aquatennial. We'll be right back. And we're back, and of course, water is something we can have a lot of fun with, and thanks to our Elizabeth Haugen for going out and getting that shot of what they were doing on the Mississippi. Well, our next guest is Michelle Martin, and she is the, get project this right, coordinator. project coordinator, I want to say program coordinator, of something very interesting and very important. It's the Fulton Rainwater Management Project. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for nice to have you here. Now, first of all, this is a specific project of one neighborhood in Minneapolis, the Fulton neighborhood. And just to orient our viewers, where is the Fulton neighborhood? We are in southwest Minneapolis, um, 47th Street to 54th, and then um, France Avenue to Penn, so just on the border of Edina. Oh, sure. 
So I'm guessing you're in the Lake Harriet watershed. We're in, yep, we're okay. in the Lake Harriet area. And yeah. that pertains to what you're doing. Yep. What is this rain? I think when people hear that, when I first heard it, rain garden, what, what is that all about, rainwater management? Yeah, well, what we're trying to do is help people look at how they manage the rainwater on their property. Um, I think people think a lot about how rain impacts their basement and their, their foundation and their home. And we're trying to help people look at how it also impacts the public areas in our neighborhood. Yeah. Um, you know, it goes down the streets, it, it goes into the lake, it goes into the creek. And what can we do as individuals to help um, deal with that problem? Um, and so we've um, worked with, um, we got an NRP grant and a grant from the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. And we created a project that, that does just that. It helps people look at their property, their gutters, their um, landscaping, um, to try to start dealing with the problem. Well, I know in some of the literature about this that I read, um, and I always love this, you help me think in a different way, um, and that is that with all the hard surfaces right. in our urban environment, it's pretty easy to think about streets, but it's also your roof right. and your sidewalks. Right. And one of the, the worst things is actually garages, because they're right next to the alleys, yeah. and usually the water just runs right off the, the roof, and unless you happen to have a gutter that, that tries to manage that, right. it goes, you know, I think most, most people who have alleys kind of think of them as rivers when there's a hard rain. Well, they often look like it. They, they look like it. You, yeah. can't, you, know, you can't get your car out of your garage yeah. for an hour or two until the um, drain goes down. And that really does cause a problem for our water system um, with the, the large levels of water all at once, as well as the sediment that goes um, into the um, water system from all of that. Well, as people get smarter and, and more sensitive about these issues, um, what will we see in terms of improved water quality? What will happen? Well, I mean, I wouldn't like to think that our eight you know, households that we've been dealing with um, in the last year are going to actually have some kind of technical impact. But right now, we're just trying to work on um, changing attitudes and helping people look at it. I, I would think if, if you had a neighborhood where um, a, you know, a large number of people started um, trying to contain their, their rainwater on their own property, you would start to see um, less, uh, I'm not a technician in this area, right. but less um, sediment going in and, and that um, just makes the, the water healthier in the lake and in the watershed okay. itself. I know again from some of the literature that you provided, um, there are numbers of ways to deal with water. And I'm not, I can't even remember them all, but right. there's infiltration and yeah. different levels. Are these some of the things that people participating yeah. are we're, putting into practice? Yeah, we're offering some very tangible things that range from, you know, purchasing a hundred dollar rain barrel, which the gutter then empties into a rain barrel that you can then use to water plants um, in your yard over the course of a week, yeah. um, all the way to doing something a little more complicated where you're actually um, rerouting your gutters and then having them drain um, into a rain garden. And what we did was we had a rain garden tour because that seems to be the most tangible thing for people to get a handle on. I should say we have some nice images of at least one of yep. the addresses. So as we're talking, maybe our viewers can see that. Um, tell us a little bit more about these rain gardens. Yep. What they are actually, they, they serve a, a tremendous function for rainwater management and they're also very attractive. Um, you basic and very simple. You, you redirect your gutters. A lot of people are putting them underground. Um, you know, from the side of the house, and then they basically empty into um, about a six inch dip that you then plant. Um, you can make it various shapes depending on your, your yard mm -hmm. um, configuration. And the water then drains into this system um, that's planted with generally um, native plants, and the native plants have a deeper root system, and so they act as a better filter for the water. So all the water from a, a rain event, or I think they, the goal is 95% um, when they're designing these, to capture 95% of the water um, that, that would come in one rain event into this system. And then instead of you know, rolling into the street or the alley, it's sitting in this rain garden um, and slowly draining and filtering at the same time. Well, and considering what a dry summer we had in the Twin Cities, this would be a nice way to sort of bank, if you will, right. up the moisture when you do get it, rather than here it comes right. and then it's down the river of the alley or the curb. 
So are you seeing some improvements that way as um, well? Yeah, I mean, people have talked about it. These just went in um, over the last year. So this is really the first year that, ah. that the um, eight people in our neighborhood who are doing this, um, it's right. the first year of growth, basically. In fact, a lot of them got them, the project done within a week before the rain garden tour we had a few weeks ago. So Just in time. Just in time. Yeah. Um, so we're not, you know, we don't have a kind of a history of what these look like. But people have been, you know, commenting about um, when there's a rain, they, it actually becomes a little bit of a pond. Mm -hmm. And then the rain stays there for an hour or two. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, the people who are doing this are really getting very involved in watching the rain and yeah. how it flows and fixing, you know, a lot of times people will put rocks around the edge of it and that's what keeps the water in and they're going out and kind of seeing where the where it spills over and, and fixing a it. more engaged with the actual process right. of all of this. They get very excited when it rains because they get to go see how their rain garden is well, functioning. Well, I know, yeah. This summer when we hadn't had rain for weeks and right. weeks and we got just a little drizzle once in a while, I'd be out looking at, right. and sometimes these are things that you don't think about until you miss them. When there isn't water, the, the, the animals mm -hmm. that are out there in your yard, your garden, in the neighborhood, maybe don't have enough to drink, whether it's birds or right. bunnies or whatever. So you retain a little of that water, you just have a more a moister environment, yeah. I suppose. You talked about some of the natural um, or native plantings, yeah. um, which we're seeing more of. Yeah. I think people are more hip to that. Yeah. Um, is there a maintenance issue with that? Is that harder to deal with, harder to get in, harder to maintain? It, they're probably harder to find initially. Um, you know, we, we help people. That's one of the things we did was help people locate where they could get these plants. Mm -hmm. You're not going to necessarily find them at the local nursery. But once you get them and then you put them in just the same way you'd put any other two-inch plug in. Um, what, but, but, but where do you go? You have to go out to Nebraska to get no, them? Or what? I mean, some of them you can order and they'll deliver them. Oh, to okay. You. So um, they are commercially available. Right, right, right. And then there's a, a great place um, up in, I believe it's Roseville, called Landscape Alternatives that has any kind of native plant you'd want. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's um, Prairie Moon, which is about an hour and a half away. And it's just, it's a vendor. It's just a it's local a, vendor, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, they're definitely available. Um, it's just you're not going to get them at the, the local. Yeah, the main, the, the store. typical conventional yeah. garden right. supply store. But if you want to make a little bit of an effort right. to find them, you get them in. Right. Once you get them in um, and get them established, uh, then you're looking at a much easier garden to maintain over the yeah. life of the garden because that's what's supposed to be here. And it may just be an assumption, but I, I, my sense is from what I see sometimes around the parks, a little more variety too. Right once they mature. Right. Yeah, you can have a great variety between grasses and flowering plants, um, and that, that attracts a lot of wildlife as well. You can plant things for that purpose. Um, how did Fulton come to decide to do this? I mean, there's so many priorities right. and needs. Right. Well, we actually have a pretty urgent priority over in the Chowan Avenue area. We, we have a pretty significant flooding problem. Um, yeah. uh, which is referred to as Lake Chowan when there's a rain. Ouch. And the um, city proposed at one point a solution that was going to take out boulevard trees to, to make room for a holding tank that would have dealt with the flooding problem, but of course um, people didn't want to see the trees go, so they created a task force to try to look at other options. And one of the recommendations was let's try to work with homeowners to see what we can do to start maintaining water on our own properties. Mm -hmm. And from that, we developed this project um, with uh, about six very interested neighbors um, to, to try to deal with the problem. And we prioritize that area. In fact, all of the rain gardens happen to be in that area. OK, so no pun intended, but literally a grassroots effort. Grassroots effort, yes. Sure. <laughs> um, commitment to another year, or? Um, yeah, we, we just did our first phase. And we're, we were considering the, the projects that we did um, to be prototypes. And then this rain garden tour we did was our marketing effort. Um, we had about 30 people come to an educational session after the rain garden tour. Wow. And those people, probably many of those people will apply for a grant um, to do a similar right. project. So these are folks who might be interested in creating, creating one themselves. One on How many own. people came to the tour? We had um, over 400 people come to the tour. Wow. And not all from your own neighborhood? No, there were people from across the metro area actually um, coming for different reasons just to look at rain gardens because they, we had a lot of people from um, professional organizations who wanted to see mm -hmm. what was happening and what could be replicated in other areas. Are landscape architects, designers moving in this direction? I mean, are there people you can go to, or is this going yeah. to be more a homeowner's no, kind I mean, of effort? No, we, we had a, um, Applied Ecological Services it was the professional group that we worked with, and um, I wouldn't say we had a huge choice of companies when we were looking for a consultant. Um, it, you know, it's something that more and more people are looking at, um, but it's, I wouldn't say it's 
it's where the you know where yeah. the bulk of, of landscape architects but are right now. It, it may be. I mean, you would hope it would be. That's why we are doing stuff. You know, things like this. Yeah. Yeah, we're kind of referring here to uh, a wonderful brochure they put together on the tour, which happened earlier in the summer. Um, if people want to get in touch with the neighborhood, I believe there's a website. Yep, FultonNeighborhood.org. FultonNeighborhood.org, and there's info on the site right. about uh, right. the management project. Yep. That's great. Michelle, thank you very much. Pleasure to know what you guys are doing. Keep up the good thank work. Thank you. That's great. Well, I'll be back to wrap up the show in just a moment, but first, Let's go by one of Minneapolis's lakes and listen to some good words from Holly Glick. She was the excellent intern for the Committee on Urban Environment over this past six months. We'll be right back. Okay, I came here in January and I came to work with the Minneapolis Planning Department as an intern and work with the Committee on Urban Environment, the Q program, just to kind of serve alongside Lonnie Nichols, who was the director at the time, and um, just kind of fill in his shoes as he exited out. In the beginning, it was I thought it was a really great entity that the city had set up just to have a connection to the citizens, um, like the grassroots efforts that were going around the city and have them all come together, like the Park Board, the Arts Commission, and the Heritage Preservation Commission, um, all under one committee that could talk and discuss the urban principles that were going on. So it was neat to get to know the people and um, I think it's a really great program and I just hope to see it go keep going. Uh, some of the challenges I see for Q are obviously the funding support. As the city of Minneapolis is going through budget cuts, uh, their staff position is being cut as well. So um, that's one crucial need that the committee needs to seek funding for right now. Um, and also is just to get the committee a little bit more diverse. Um, there's some really great people on there uh, from all different backgrounds and places of the city. But it'd be neat to see some ethnic backgrounds and racial backgrounds just getting involved in the committee and just the grassroots level really taking form in the committee. Uh, some of the opportunities for Q are really just um, getting their name out there and really working with um, the people, everyday citizens, and improving the urban environment block by block. And that's with our front porch project. That's what they're trying to do is um, really extend themselves out there and get the social classes coming together and just improving the social capital of the urban environment. And also Bloomy Boulevards is one of our programs and improving the streets yard by yard and the boulevard strip just to beautify our city and also to promote social interaction among the neighbors as they get out there and garden and get to know each other. Well being from Iowa and a small town girl um, is really fun to come to the city and even surviving through the harsh winter. Um, it's been really great as the summer's warming up and just getting out to the lakes and really exploring the park systems that are around the city. And I think that's one of the biggest assets to Minneapolis is just the amount of tree canopy and green space and that um, everybody who lives in the city is within a six block radius to a park. And that's a really special attribute to the city. And plus, you know, all the fun things to do and Sebastian Joe's and the neat, unique restaurants and shopping, so. Well, and thank you, Holly. Holly Glick was uh, an excellent intern for Q the first half of this year, and we just want to get a few of her thoughts on camera. And speaking of Q, this show is brought to you by Friends of Q, and if you like what you see on this show, or you want to support Q in general, think about making a donation to Friends of Q. We'll have a number on at the end of our show about how to reach them and all that. Um, if you want a little more information about water, how it relates here in the city of Minneapolis, a couple of videos you might look for on this station. Uh, there's something called Every Curb is a Shoreline Watershed Awareness. Uh, and I think the Hennepin County University Extension Service and the Minneapolis Parks put that together. It's a good show. Also, the city regulatory services did a great show on watersheds. And that occasionally runs on this channel that you're watching. Our next show, we're really excited. We're going to talk about historic preservation. And until then, I am your host of On Cue. Stay tuned, and it's good to be here. <laughs>